we came up with this topic probably a couple months ago and planned it for this date. And there was a little bit of a discussion back and forth what we should do with the lecture. And uh, the conclusion was that we should really lean into the topic. To the contrary, we need it more than ever. And although it's difficult, it's difficult at a time like this to speak about positivity, it's probably the most important thing to speak about right now. It's, dare I say, absolutely vital. And I think that maybe the spirit of the evening is probably best encapsulated in the timeless words of uh, the Broadway musical, that God would like us to be joyful even when our heart lies panting on the floor. And yeah, I know, it's a silly musical, Fiddler on the Roof, but they really did nail it. That line, at least. You know the song, To Life, To Life, L'chaim. Um, that line really does nail it. The paradox of Jewish joy. And that it's not that we're just choosing to be joyful on a whim. God would like us to be joyful. It's a divine mandate. Our creator has told us to be joyful, even at times when we are a wreck. And in fact, the paradox is even deeper than that because we continue to feel the pain. It's not like the pain goes away because of the joy, and yet somehow, simultaneously, with the pain is the joy. And I don't think there could be anything more Jewish than that. <laughs> so, that's it. That's what we're here for. Okay. I'll tell you some stories that have happened the past week or so. One of them was from uh, a story involving a, a mother who took my parenting course. I have a parenting course. Baruch Hashem, many, many parents have taken this course. And uh, this woman took the parenting course over a year ago. So she reaches out to me last week. And she says, Rabbi Taub, I took your parenting course and I'm losing it. My kids left out their toys and I snapped and I yelled at them because I'm so stressed out. And I'm reading it and it's so far a very, you know, regular uh, run-of-the-mill uh, type of text that I would receive, that I do receive multiple times a day. And uh, it, I just feel so bad that I'm snapping at them because I'm, uh, because I'm stressed, because we live in Beersheba. And the sirens are going off all day and night. And I don't know when we have to go run and hide. And I don't know what's happening. And, and I lost it. And I, and I yelled at my kids because they didn't put their toys away. How do I even respond to this? I mean, this is not a normal situation to be in. She wants parenting tips, but she's living in a, in a war zone. And... Uh, then I stopped and I thought to myself, first of all, she's reaching out to me, so I got to have something for her. But then what really helped me is I thought to myself, and this is a morbid thought, but it's an inspiring thought. And maybe this is just another illustration of the paradox. Is this the first Jewish mother in history who had to be gentle and warm and loving and sweet to her children while there was mortal danger outside? I mean, it, it sounds weird to say the sentence, but is this a new thing? This is not a new thing. In fact, an argument could be made, this is Jewish parenting. I mean, we have millennia of Jewish parenting, and much of it took place under absolutely harrowing conditions, conditions that really testify to the miracle of Jewish continuity. The fact that there's been so much Jewish parenting under life and death conditions and that there's still Jewish parenting going on. That, that, that's a miracle. That's a miracle. And, and Jewish parenting sort of is miraculous. So I responded to her and I said, listen, you know, you took the parenting course and really I, I don't think there's anything 
different or unique that you need to hear in your situation. I think it's just you're now doing what we're all doing, but you're doing it in expert mode. Like you're playing the game on the highest setting right now. Meaning to say, this, 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 this is life. Life is we deal with stress. We deal with difficulties that are out of our control. And yet we, we, we endeavor to maintain a calm and hopefully even joyful attitude so that we can nurture our children and provide safety and security for them. That's what we're all doing. Okay, so you're just doing it under more intense conditions. And it felt a little bit like chutzpah for me to say that to her. But at the same time, something told me that was the right thing to tell her. So uh, the next day, she sends me a, a WhatsApp. And she says she wants to thank me so much. It really, really helped. And all day, she's been playing with her children. And she's been calming them. And she's been soothing them. And she's been able to connect with them in a very warm way. And it's because she said she just went back to basics. You know, the, what, what, I mean, it's a six-week course, the parenting course. But if you want me to give away the, the main ideas in a sentence, it's basically just Jewish spirituality. It's about faith. It's about connection to Hashem. And that's what she returned to. And that's where she found her, her footing. She found her stability. And she was able to transmit that stability to her children. So she says to me, when it really clicked for her, was she was heading to bed and she said she turned to her husband and she said, I'm going to bed now. It's very likely I'll be awoken to the sound of sirens. She says, uh, but I want to tell you something uh, I'm also thinking as I'm heading to bed. I'm thinking that it's possible that I'll be awoken in the middle of the night to a loud noise, and I'll say, oh my goodness, it's the siren. You have to head into the, into the shelter. And then I'll stop, and I'll say, she says this to her husband as she's about to go to bed. And then I'll stop, and I'll say, hold on a second. It's not quite the sound of a siren, is it? What is that sound? It's a shofar. It's Mashiach's shofar. It's the sound of the shofar heralding the, the redemption. Mashiach is here. And that's, that's how she went to bed. And, you know, you can, you can be cynical, skeptical, but the proof is in the pudding. She got up the next morning and she was able to play with her kids and she was able to soothe them. She was able to be sweet and nurturing. And her children were able to, to feel safe with her. And in a way, again, this feels so strange to say this, but in doing that, this woman, who's a woman who lives in our time, she, she, she WhatsApps me. I mean, she's, she's, she's not somebody from history. But in soothing her children, connecting to Hashem, and, and gaining emotional stability so that she could soothe her children... In doing that, she basically relived a scene that has probably been acted out millions of times in Jewish history. So that's what we do. That's what we do. This, this is what Jewish parenting is. This is what Jewish life is. Not that we want to be in crisis and turmoil. Not that we invite horror and, 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 and terror and brutality, but when that's the situation, our game plan doesn't change. Meaning that which is real remains real. We stay focused on the fact that we believe in God, we believe in his providence, even when we don't understand his ways and we can't fathom his ways and we're even horrified by what's happening. But we know that there is a God. We know that he protects his people. We know that there's purpose. We know that we have a purpose. We know that, 
There are people who are depending on us and we have to tap into our sense of purpose so that we can show up for them. That's what we do. That's what we do. So I'll tell you another story. And I'm telling these stories deliberately. I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit about my thought process here. See, we're, we're in Long Island right now. We're uh, New York. And I know people are stressed. But I'm, I want to tell you stories about people in Eretz Yisrael right now. Maybe, I'm, maybe this is a, a dirty trick, but I kind of want to, I'm not trying to guilt you. <laughs> Or, or manipulate you, but I do want you to understand that if they can do it over there, come on, we got to be able to do it over here, okay? And, it, and it's not because we don't care, and it's not because we're, we have a cavalier attitude. It's because this is how we survive. This is how our people survive. And it doesn't take away the pain, but the pain doesn't preclude our having a positive attitude as much as possible, even while we're in pain. So if they can do it over there, we can do it here. I'll tell you another story. There was a Jewish girl who got engaged. She got engaged on, uh, during the days of Sukkot. How do I know that? Because her father sent me a video of his Dvar Torah that he set at her engagement party. Her father um, is the, uh, the famous basketball player, Tamir Goodman. And he apparently is a big fan of my daily Sefer HaMitzvahs shir. Every day we put out the daily Sefer HaMitzvahs, the Rambam's Sefer HaMitzvahs. We learn a mitzvah or two or three different Mitzvahs that correspond to whatever subject matter is being studied in the three chapters of Mishnah Torah. And uh, apparently he's very into that. So he sent me a video. So the Rebbe was very big on Rambam, studying Rambam every day. And I was learning today's Rambam. And there was three points in, in the Rambam that I thought were very perfect messages for, for Khatan Mekala. Um, we're talking about the Karbanot. So the I think it was Kalamite who sent me the video of his Dvar Torah. And he gets up and he says, the Lubavitcher Rebbe was very into learning Rambam every day and I learn Sefer Mitzvahs every day. And today, the mitzvah from Sefer Mitzvahs, it was, we were still in the Sefer Avoida, which is about the work in the Beis HaMikdash. And he said, today the mitzvahs were uh, the, the Korban Tomid, the regular offering that was brought every day, the daily offering. The, uh, the fire that's always kept on the altar and uh, Truma Sadashin, taking out the ashes from the altar. So he said, everything is divine providence, so I want to tell you three marriage tips based on the mitzvahs from today's Sefer Mitzvahs. He sent me this video. He says, first marriage tip is the Talmud is the regular offering. Consistency, consistency. Doesn't matter what's going on, you got to be there for your spouse. The Talmud means constant, consistent showing up. He says, the Eish Tomid, the fire on the altar. What's that? The passion. You got to keep the passion going, keep that fire going. And what's Truma Sadashin taking out the ashes? He says, you got to take out the garbage, <laughs> literally and emotionally. Whatever the negativity is, you got to remove it. You can't, you can't keep negativity in the house. So he says, those are the mitzvahs today. On today's uh, Sefer mitzvahs, that's my, that's my, my marriage tips to the Chosin and Kala. Mazel tov. Okay. <coughs> so that was the intermediate days of Sukkot, and his daughter, Aria, got engaged. Well, I should mention something that the Kala, Tamir's daughter, Aria, is also in the IDF, in the spokesperson's unit. And she was called up on Simchas Torah. So she'd been engaged for a few days. We're talking about a young Kala. Now she's, she's called up to her unit. So I was speaking to her on the base. And I said, how are you holding up? You know, a lot of young girls 
getting engaged would rather be picking out uh, China patterns, all types of stuff that a, that a young bride-to-be is involved in. And uh, she's on the base. So I said, how are you holding up? So she says, I'm fine. Baruch Hashem, I learned a lot of Shara Betochen. Shara Betochen, the, the gate of trust. So, uh, so I said, that's fantastic. She says, yep, yeah, that's how I, uh, that's how I stay focused. I said, you know, a lot of people here are watching a lot of news. They're not learning Shara Betochen and feeling focused and uplifted. They're watching a lot of news. They're consuming a lot of media and they're feeling not so good. I said, could you do me a favor? Could you make a message encouraging people to stop looking at the news so much and open up the Shara Betochen? So she said, sure, as soon as I'm off duty. And uh, she sent me this video. It went fair, fairly viral. It's the best video I've ever seen in my life, honestly. My name is Arya Gunman and I'm a soldier in the IDF spokesperson unit. This past week has been extremely challenging for Amistral on every single level imaginable. And I know many of us are just feeling lost and hopeless and like we want to help, but we don't know exactly what to do or where to turn during this very, very challenging time. So I'm here to deliver a quick message that could hopefully help and inspire people that are going through a hard time right now. I know instinctively during challenging times, our instinct is to turn to the news or to turn to politicians or to different sources to try to gain clarity and, and some understanding on this very, very challenging and overwhelming situation. But I'm here to tell you that the greatest thing that we could do during this time is strengthen our emuna and mitachon and Hashem. Um, specifically through learning Torah every single day. And I highly, highly recommend Shara Bitachon. I've been learning it every day and it's really, really impacting me during this crazy time, especially being on base. Um, in the third chapter of Shara Bitachon, Rabbeinu Bahai brings five different factors that help us strengthen our Bitachon and Hashem. And he explains that one of them is realizing that there's divine providence, that there's a shkacha on every single human in this world. Hashem created us and therefore he watches over us and he recreates the world every single second so he understands what we're going through. The Baal Shem Tov takes this one step further and explains that not only is there divine providence on every single human, but on every single thing that Hashem created, he watches over closely. He gives the example of even the smallest blade of grass that sways in the wing, in the, in the wind, has hashkacha over it. Hashem is constantly watching over it and recreating the world and understanding what it's going through. So if we could kind of internalize this message and realize that if Hashem is watching over the smallest, smallest blade of grass, of course he's watching over us many, 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 many times more. And he understands what we're going through and he understands the struggle and, and the suffering that we're going through right now. And he's here for us and he hears our cry. And the greatest thing that we could do during this very challenging time is strengthen our relationship with him and our trust in him and our bitachon in him. And just another short thought, what's unique about this war is that it's a war of all of Kali Israel, meaning every single person needs to do their part in order to help us win. We have soldiers on the front line, but every single person has opportunity to be, to be a soldier in their own way. Everyone has their own unique shlichas, their own unique mission, what they can do to contribute to help with this war. So we have soldiers on the front line, we have people learning Torah, people giving tzedakah, people packing care packages for chayalim. We need every single person as a group effort to help win this war. So when you learn Shara Bitachon and you strengthen your emunah and, and you shake the heavens, and connect to Kaddish Baruch Hu, this directly impacts the success of the army and of all of Kal Yisrael. So I just give us a bracha that we should have much of Tzacha and we should all be united as one because this is the only way that we're going to be able to get through this and wishing everyone lots of good news. So you hear what she says, that all Kal Yisrael has a role to play here. So there are soldiers on the front lines but then there are those who support the effort in their own way. And each one of us is instrumental to our people's victory and safety and security. And that means that like a soldier, a soldier marches out with confidence and with joy and with a, with a tune, with a march, 
So to all of us, soldiers all know that it is critical to their success that they preserve, maintain, and even build up troop morale. You, you can't win a war without being in high spirits. And you're going to say, how can somebody who's in the middle of a war zone be in high spirits? And the answer is, you don't have a choice. And so, again, this is not something that we're doing on a whim just because we feel like it frivolously. We would like to have a good time. We have to know that troop morale is vital, is critical, essential. And every single one of us, our attitude is absolutely critical in, in what happens, in shaping what happens. So we've got to tap into our joy. We've got to tap into our confidence and our, and our sense of security, even, even when at the same time we're, we're, we're feeling pain. Yom Kippur, 1970, was the outbreak of the Yom Kippur War. And those who were watching the Lubavitcher Rebbe closely <laughs> saw very clear indications that the Rebbe was worried, the Rebbe was concerned. Uh, Ten days earlier on Rosh Hashanah, when the Rebbe was, was blowing the shoifer, apparently he was, he was very serious. There was one point where he was weeping. People could tell something was going on. Then, of course, Yom Kippur was a surprise attack. And uh, 3,000 soldiers were wiped out in one day on Yom Kippur. Toward the end of the day, we have a prayer called Ne'ilah, the fifth prayer of the day. And apparently, during Ne'ilah, sp specifically during the Avinu Malkenu prayer, the Rebbe was weeping uncontrollably. Now, how do I explain this to you? There was a, a custom that the Rebbe instituted. It was the Rebbe's thing. That after the end of Ni'ilah, and it continues to be custom uh, in Lubavitch shuls, we sing Napoleon's March. Napoleon's March is a song that goes back to the, to the days of Napoleon. I won't get into the whole Chabad history, but seven generations before the Rebbe was the Alter Rebbe, the author of the Tanya. And he lived during the Napoleonic Wars, and in fact, he was fleeing his home in White Russia because of the onslaught of the, of the French army. And uh, the Alter Rebbe was very, very opposed to Napoleon. He believed that Napoleon was a negative force and that he would destroy the spiritual fabric of European Jewry. And uh, without getting into a whole long story about it, but at one point when the al Rebbe was fleeing, they could hear the song that the French soldiers were singing. And uh, the al Rebbe said, they're singing a song of victory, but the victory will be ours. And he appropriated that song and it became a Chabad Nigun. And it's a, it's a military march. It's a military march, but we, we turned it into a Hasidic song. And that's the song that they would sing at the end of Ne'ilah. And in fact, the Rebbe would stand up on his chair and dance. And the spirits were extremely high. It was sort of an ecstatic high point of the high holidays. And the, it, basically it symbolized the idea that after the 10 days of penitence, now our good judgment has completely been sealed. Our father, our king has written us and sealed us for life in the book of life. And now we finished the Yom Kippur, we finished the Day of Atonement. Okay, it's like you're leaving the courthouse victoriously. We have a favorable judgment. 
And what else do you do but celebrate, right? And so that, that, was, that was always the idea there. And uh, it's Avino Makeno of Nila, just a few minutes before the Napoleon's March would traditionally start. And the Rebbe is weeping uncontrollably. And people were, st this is before the days of internet, but people were starting to get news. Uh, I think what I heard from people who were there is that uh, the police, the New York City police, were getting information on their radios. And people were hearing the numbers, 3,000 soldiers wiped out. It was, they understood why the Rebbe was crying. And so now it's a couple minutes before Napoleon's march and the Rebbe's weeping. And people in the know were sort of watching closely, what's the Rebbe going to do? And you have to understand the significance of this. You know, it's almost unthinkable. How's the Rebbe not going to get up on that chair and dance and lead us in an ecstatic march song? You understand the repercussions, what that would mean, God forbid? I mean... It's unthinkable. And yet, the news is coming in that Eb is weeping, that he should stand up on a chair and dance is perhaps equally unthinkable. And so I'll, 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 I'll tell you what happened. That Eb got up on his chair and he started the song, and everybody burst out in singing. And you know that uh, Yom Kippur, we wear the talus all day long, the whole day. In fact, we leave it on even after the day is over. We keep it on for Maida, for the evening coming out of uh, Yom Kippur. So the Rebbe stood on the chair, and he was waving and cheering, like in a way, way beyond a regular year. But at the same time, he kept his talus over his face the entire time, and he, everyone could hear him weeping. So you can imagine that scene. That on one hand, the Rebbe is standing on the chair, dancing and leading everybody in a march. And at the same time, the Rebbe's face, the Rebbe's holy face is covered in his talus, and behind the talus, he's weeping. And I think that sort of sums it up for us that even at times when the pain is so great that we cannot hold back the tears, that does not preclude our standing on a chair and dancing and singing, and even if you have to sing through the tears. Again, not because we want to be in a good mood, we like to party, but because this is what God expects of us, because this has been the, the key to our survival. So three days later, Yud Gimel Tishrei, 13th day of Tishrei, there was a Fabrengen. Now that wasn't unusual because uh, the 13th day of Tishrei is the yard site of the fourth Chabad Rebbe, the Rebbe Maharash, Rav Shmuel. And the Rebbe would often Fabreng that day. So there was a Fabrengen that day, festival gathering. And the Rebbe said right from the very beginning of the, of the Fabreng, when the Rebbe started to speak, he basically called out the elephant in the room and said, how is it possible that we're gathered here for a festive gathering and we know what's happening right now? In other words, there was a surprise attack on Yom Kippur. 3,000 soldiers were wiped out in one day. It's not like everything got resolved later that day. They were still at war. They were in the middle of the war. And it's three days after the, that it just broke out. So the Rebbe asks, how is it possible that we're here? How is it possible that we're, we're gathering and we're fabrenging? So the Rebbe said, we have a teaching from the Baal Shem Tev that was transmitted to us through Rav Levi Yitzchok Berdichever. <clears throat> Rav Levi Yitzchok Berdichever said that in Psalms, King David says, 
Hashem Shemracha, Hashem Tzilcha. Hashem is your guardian, Hashem is your shade. And normally that is translated as your protective shade. But the Baal Shem Tov explained, and we received from the Bredichever, that Hashem Tzilcha could also mean Hashem is your shadow. What's the significance of Hashem being your shadow? That just like when you move, your shadow moves exactly the way you move, so too Hashem, so to speak, shadows our movements. There is a law of reciprocity that is set up in the universe whereby Hashem will mirror back to us what we put out. So when we show joy, Hashem shines joy back to us. Hashem tzilcha. He shadows us, he reflects, he mimics, he, he, he imitates, he matches our movements. So the Rebbe said that as much as it doesn't feel like a time for joy, this is precisely the time that we need to generate as much joy as possible because that will trigger from on high that we will have what to be joyful about. This week's Parsha is Parsha's Lech Lecha. And uh, Lech Lecha is about the life of the first Jew, of Ramavino, of Father Abraham. And we know that Maisa of Simon Labonim, that the, the deeds of the fathers create sort of like a, an archetype or a model, a template. They establish a pattern that will be relived by the patriarch's descendants, meaning by us. So when we study the lives of the patriarchs, we're really studying the, the template that's ingrained in our, in our story. It helps us get back on track sometimes when we've drifted from our story. So one of the things that happens to Avraham this week, this week's Torah portion, is um, his nephew who's also his brother-in-law, is named Light. In English, they call him Lot. I'll call him Light. So Light was living in a bad neighborhood. Uh, he chose to live there. He kind of, yeah, he kind of liked it there. And uh, he, got, he got kidnapped. He was a prisoner of war. And uh, what happened is, he was basically caught in the crossfire. There was a world war. It was the war of the five kings and the four kings. By the way, who was the more powerful force? It's the four kings. Rashi tells us they were so powerful, they only needed four guys. They had four kings, and they were more powerful than the five kings. So the four kings took light as a prisoner of war. Um, Avram was a civilian. There was this guy named Oig. Oig was a giant. He actually was a survivor of the flood. He was from before the flood. He was an interesting guy. At any rate, Oig comes to Avraham and he says, I have terrible news. Have you heard? Your nephew Light was taken as a prisoner of war. Why don't you go save him? Now, the Medrash tells us that the whole thing was a ruse. Oig was not actually concerned with light. Oig wanted to marry Sarah. Sarah is the wife of Avram. She's also the sister of light. That's how Avram and light become brothers-in-law. So Oig really just wanted to bump off Avram so he could marry Avram's widow, Sarah. And he figured, this way I, I won't even have to do the dirty work. What'll I do? I'll come tell this guy, go rescue your brother-in-law from the POW camp, and he'll get killed. And then when he gets killed, I'll swoop in, I'll marry Sarah. So that's the story the Medrash tells us. Now, I don't want to pick apart the story, but I'll ask a question. 
since the whole premise of the story is that going to save light was essentially a kamikaze mission. It wasn't. One guy is going to go and take on the army of the four kings. It's like, it's ridiculous. So the whole thing was a setup. The whole thing was just this ridiculous fool's errand to send Avram to get killed. So if the premise, and in fact, the entire the, the entire idea of, of Ike's plot was that he was sending Avram to get killed, then what, what a ridiculous plot to even attempt. Why did Ike think that Avram would fall for it? Like, it's a... It's a re- you understand? It's like, that's not a normal thing to goad somebody into. Like, oh yeah, th- there's, there's a world war going on, and you, an individual, you're going to go and you're going to fight a bunch of armies. Yeah, yeah, you'll be fine. You'll, you'll, you'll be able to take them. Why would Avram even fall for such a thing? It's a silly plot. It's a silly plan. Who does he think he's dealing with? That's one question. Another thing is, we're told that at the time Oig showed up and he found Avraham, he was baking matzos. He was baking matzos. It was Pesach, so he was baking matzos. Now you're going to say, hold on a second. I don't know exactly the years, but I, I can figure out that Avram was a few centuries before the Exodus. Eating matzah on Pesach is to commemorate the Exodus. You're telling me Avram was commemorating the Exodus hundreds of years before it happened? So that's not such a, a, a big question. The, the answer is yes, he was. He was a prophet. And he was tuned in to the energies of the time. We know, by the way, that's how Jewish time works. That the things that happened on auspicious days, it's not that the event made the day auspicious, it's that the the auspicious energy of the day made the event ultimately transpire. So there's a certain energy that was always present at that time of year. And in fact, it continues to be present at that time of year, which is how we tap into it every year at our Pesach celebration. Uh, and it was present on a spiritual level hundreds of years before it transpired on the physical plane. And Avram, as a, as a prophet, was, was tuned into it, and he understood what was happening. So he knew it was Pesach. He knew Pesach hadn't happened yet in the physical realm, but he knew it was going to happen, and knew roughly what it was about, and he understood he, he's eating matzah to celebrate it. And the Medrash says, that's why Oig is called Oig, because when he showed up, Avram was eating Ugais matzah. Matzah is called in the Torah Ugais. Cakes, matzah cakes. So, Oig, Ugais. It's like a pun. Well, midrashic pun. Okay. But then you get asked the question well, hold on a second. Oig's name is always Oig. Why is it, why is it pertinent that, that there's this matzah pun to his name during that? interaction. I mean, the Medrash could have told us that about Oig at any other interaction, any other inter- interval where he shows up. He's a, he's a recurring character. I mean, he could have told us some other time. Why is it specifically, we mentioned Oig, Ugas Matza, the whole Matza thing, Pesach, why is it connected to that incident? Okay, so I'm not going to directly answer that, any of those questions. I'm going to tell you a story. Um... Story is that Herman Branover got out of Russia in the 70s. He was a refusenik for many years, and he finally got out. A scientist, I think his field was uh, hydrodynamics or maybe magnetohydrodynamics. Um, and he was working, I believe, at the University of the Negev in Beersheba. And... Uh, he was very close to the Lubavitcher Rebbe. So, the Rebbe actually reached out to him. The Rebbe reached out to him that he should come for a private audience, Yechidus, in 1985. <clears throat> and the Rebbe tells Branover, Professor Branover, when you go back to Eretz Yisrael, when you go back to Israel, You have to tell anyone who will listen that there's going to be an influx of Russian Jews 
and they need to build housing. You got to start now building housing. Okay. Now, if anyone remembers 1985, I mean, I, I still have my let my let my people go button from 1985. Okay, like when a family would get out, a family would get out back in the 80s. That would be like the talk of the town for a year. Nobody was getting out, and the Rebbe is telling Branover, "You got to tell them in Israel to start building. You got to build. You got to have housing for all these Russian Jews." Brandover goes back to Israel. He says, well, Mavichud Rebbe told me they got to start building for the Russians. And nobody believed him. Nobody believed him. Even the Lubavitchers didn't believe him because they said, you misheard. That's not what the Rebbe said. So he couldn't get anyone to do anything. Two years later, 87, he saw the Rebbe again. And the Rebbe pushed him again. You got to start building. This Russian's coming out. You got to build. You got to build. And this was totally unthinkable. In fact... It's interesting, I looked up the New York Times article from uh, when Gorbachev first took over. Remember I was a kid, they had those, they had that, what they had, that, that uh, what's his name, Brezhnev for a while, and then he died, and then they had like these two guys, Lechenyenko and Dropov, they both died, like one had a cold, but he didn't, and he was dead for a year, and they didn't tell him, and then, and then Gorbachev, remember this? Any Russians here remember this? Yeah, yeah you remember this? Okay. The New York Times wrote, when, when Gorbachev was installed, that he's going to be a hardliner back to Khrushchev, and maybe worse. That's what they wrote about him. Now, you're always, what? That's what they wrote? Because you all know the end of the story. Like Paul Harvey used to say the rest of the story. You know about Perestroika. You, you know, Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall, and he did. But in 85, they were this guy's going to go back to Khrushchev. He's going to be a hardliner. So the Rebbe's telling Branover, tell everyone in Israel, build, 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 because the Russians are coming. Nobody will listen to him. Well, we know the rest of the story is that after decades of terror, of being this, this looming negative force that oppressed millions of Jews, they just disappeared. They just disappeared. Just like that. So, in 1992, Gorbachev visited Israel, and he went to the, to the Kaisel, to the Western Wall. And part of the entourage there was Herman Brandover, Professor Brandover. So, Brandover comes over to Gorbachev, and says, I want to tell you something interesting. My Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, was telling me back in 85 what you were going to do. That you were going to loosen things up and the Jews would be able to leave. And uh, what do you think about that? And Gorbachev laughed. He told Branover, he says, the Lubavitcher Rebbe told you that in 85? He knew that in 85? He says, Yeah. Gorbachev says, I want to tell you something. I didn't know that in 1985. I didn't know I was going to do any of that. So, if you look at Jewish history on paper, if you look at what makes sense, if you look at what the pundits and the analysts and the experts are going to say, that's one thing. And if you would ask them, I don't think anybody would believe that the Jewish people still exist. Not a normal thing. Not a po Statistically, there were so many opportunities, God forbid, to be wiped out. How could this small nation still be here? So if you look at it from human eyes, Jewish history makes no sense. No sense at all. And if you look at it from godly eyes, it begins to make sense that God made a contract with his people and our entire existence is miraculous and has been since, since our father, Avraham. And that's it. Jewish history doesn't make sense. The survival of the Jewish people doesn't make sense. So, 
where should we get our worldview from? From experts who are looking through human eyes or from the timeless guidance that has seen our people through all types of trials and tribulations and ups and downs? I mean, come on. The world may be surprised about our longevity and our survival, but we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised. We should, act, we should actually become so miraculous and so accustomed to miracles that that's what we expect. We are miracles. Every Jewish person who walks this earth and draws breath today is a living miracle and a testimony to the eternality of God himself. And we have to be in that mode. We have to be in that mode. And yes, at the same time, we're humans. And when we are in pain, we cry. And we don't have to suppress it. And we don't have to be in denial. We don't have to pretend we're not having those feelings. But at the same time, we have to be miraculous. And we have to be tapped into that worldview. And we have to know that Jewish history makes zero sense. And that the only thing we know is consistent is that the Jewish people will continue to be here and that we all know how this story ends. It's a happy ending. In the end, Mashiach comes and that there's world peace. And it's very interesting, by the way. The end of our story is world peace. And we would like, really, everyone should be involved in that. Now, some people aren't going to want to take part in that. That's their loss. But optimally, we would love everybody to take part in the perfect peace and prosperity that will exist when Mashiach comes. That's what we know can happen any moment. We know this will happen. This is what we expect. And if God has to make overt miracles, let him make overt miracles. And if he can pull it off with plausible deniability and make it look like it happened naturally, okay, let, let him do it that I, I don't care. It doesn't, it doesn't bother me how he does it. But what we know, we know how this ends. We all know that inexplicably, supernaturally, the Jewish people will always be here and continue to thrive. And the good times are coming. That's it. That is our story. Doesn't make sense, but that's the story. Okay, so Avram Avinu, the matzahs, oig. You think the Soviet Union was the first time the Jewish people were up against an oppressive superpower? You go through history, pretty much every superpower that existed oppressed the Jews. You go back far enough, you get to the, the original, the original uh, oppressors of the Jews, the, the ancient Egyptians. They had the most powerful empire in the world. In fact, they had the entire wealth of the world concentrated in their, in their coffers. You know the background story is because of a smart Jewish boy who was their uh, viceroy, because of Yosef, because of Joseph. But when he was working for Pharaoh, so they had all the there was a global famine and they amassed all the wealth. Egypt was the most powerful, most wealthy, and um, and the Jews were their slaves, and no one was going to leave. People attempted to leave; they couldn't. Not one slave was successful in leaving Egypt. Not one slave. In fact, we say every year at the Seder, when you read the Haggadah, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. And if God had not taken us out of there, we would still be. So naturally speaking, without the miraculous intervention of God, Egypt was going to remain a superpower. In fact, that's actually the explanation of why they would have been a superpower. Because you, you ask yourself a question, eventually Egypt would have disappeared. I mean, they would have controlled us until they finally became like a second-rate or third-rate country. They wouldn't be able to continue to control us. No, 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 you don't understand. You're reversing the cause and effect. As long as the Jews would have, would have remained in Egypt, Egypt would have remained the superpower. They only took a dive after they lost their Jews. Like every other empire that got rid of us. But at any rate, the point is, Naturally speaking, there was no way that anyone was getting out of Egypt. Not one person was going to get out. 
And then all of a sudden, what happened? On one day, the entire nation, men, women, and children, just sauntered out. Just walked right out. And there was nothing the Egyptians could do about it. And in fact, they left so quickly, it was so fast, the whole, the, whole, the whole thing went down so quickly, they didn't even have time for the bread to rise. Right? They were leaving with that, that raw dough that had to bake in the sun. So here's this, this superpower that was so formidable for so many centuries, and boom, just like that, disappears like so much smoke. And that's what we celebrate when we eat the matzah. We, we eat the matzah to remind us that when the mighty Egyptian juggernaut suddenly collapsed, it all happened so quickly, we didn't even have time to pack a lunch. We didn't have time for the dough to rise. That's what the matzah symbolizes. That when the mighty oppressors of the Jews fall, they fall very quickly. That's what the matzah symbolizes. So now you understand the story of Oig. He rolls in, and he's thinking in the back of his mind, I would love to get this guy killed. And I could get him killed if he'd be enough of a sucker that he would go try to free his brother-in-law. But who's going to do that? You'd have to be crazy. One guy is going to go fight a massive alliance of kings and their armies. No normal person is going to do that. So Egg rolls in and he sees Avram with the dough. And he says, what are you making? He says, I'm making matzah. Oh, what's that about? He's like, well, it celebrates the liberation of our people. A few hundred years from now, the superpower of the world is going to collapse and we're just going to walk out and it's all going to happen so quickly we won't even have time for the bread to rise. And Oig's like, yeah, you really believe that? He's like, oh, sure, yeah. He's like, great, i got a bridge to sell you in Brooklyn, right? Now he knows he's dealing with a sucker. So he says, hey, hey, hey. did you hear? Light was taken as a prisoner of war by the four kings. But don't worry, you know, I, I, I think you can take him. I knew that he could talk that kind of crazy talk to Avram because he saw what kind of a, a wild guy Avram was. And then you know what happened? Avram did it. And he went and he actually did rest, not only rescue Light, but then he defeated the four kings. And then the five kings wanted to, to reward him. That's Jewish history. That crazy things happen. Miraculous things happen. Like I said, our existence itself is a testimony to the existence of God. I'll tell you one last thing. This is one of my nerdy uh, preoccupations. But I got very interested in a word. I like words. And I got very interested in a word. Uh, the word, in, an English word, but it's not originally, the etymology actually is medieval Spanish. I'll, I'll get into it in a second. I got interested in the word quixotic. Quixotic. It means irrationally idealistic and hopeful. It means unrealistically optimistic. Which basically sounds like what we're talking about. That's, that's us. That's the Jews. Right? So where does this word come from? What's the etymology? It's actually from Don Quixote. Don Quixote is... Uh, a work of medieval Spanish literature written by Miguel de Cervantes. In, uh, in English-speaking countries, we call him the Spanish Shakespeare. I wonder if in Spain they call Shakespeare the English Cervantes. I don't know. <laughs> it's like when Shalom Aleichem met Mark Twain, and he said, they, they call me the Jewish Mark Twain, and Mark Twain said, you know, that's interesting. People call me the uh, American Shalom Aleichem. But Cervantes wrote this book, 
uh, Don Quixote. Don Quixote was this uh, crazy guy, and he thought he was a knight in shining armor, and he was fighting dragons to rescue a damsel in distress. But the whole point of the book is, is he really a fool? Or is the world a fool for not seeing what Don Quixote sees? Then I started looking into it more because I said, that's very Jewish. Like, he's the only one who sees the truth, right? It's very Jewish. And therefore, he's like wildly optimistic, even when everyone tells him he's a fool. So I started looking into it. There's a prevailing theory now among the, uh, the scholars of Cervantes that he was a crypto Jew. It was a hidden Jew, which really shouldn't shock you because statistically there are some estimates that like a third of Spain come from hidden Jewish lineage. Some estimates, that's on the high end. But uh, there were certainly a lot of hidden Jews. And there's some theories about it, you know, in medieval Spanish pronunciation, you wouldn't pronounce it Quixote, you'd pronounce it Quixote. And actually, Quixote is truth in Zoharic Aramaic. Quixote is truth. So Don Quixote, Don Quixote, Quixote, he's the master of the truth. He's the only one who sees the truth. They think he's a wild, crazy dreamer, but really he sees the truth. It shouldn't surprise you also that when they turned Don Quixote into a musical on Broadway, I think this is the second Broadway musical I'm mentioning tonight, um, Man of La Mancha, I don't remember the names, but the writer and the producer and uh, the one who uh, wrote the music were all Jews. And they had that very, very Jewish song. You know that Jewish song? The Impossible Dream. The impossible. What could be more Jewish than the impossible? To dream the impossible dream. You know what I'm talking about? To fight the unbeatable foe. Next line chokes me out. Hold on. To bear with unbearable sorrow. See, that's so Jewish. It's unbearable sorrow. And we bear with it. To bear that which cannot be born. To run where the brave dare not go. That's the impossible dream. So, I'll teach you a new word today, kids. Quixotic. We, the Jewish people, are quixotic. We have an absurdly optimistic, irrationally positive view on life. Makes no sense to anyone else in the world. Maybe doesn't even make sense to us. But we're here. We're the proof that it works. And this is what we have to transmit to our children. And no, we're not going to scroll on our phones and terrorize ourselves and then go leak that toxicity into our children's minds and hearts. We're going to stop that. We're going to stop that. You're going to tap into what your ancestors tapped into. You're going to tap into what our people are... It's happening now. There's a, there's a revival of, of faith, of, 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 of belief in, in, our, in our common destiny, how we're all linked together. There's this, there's this mutual love that we have together. You're going to tap into that, whether it's through a, a Parsha class or saying some, some Tehillim or whatever it is that speaks to you, that inspires you. Put down the phone, turn off the news, go learn some Torah and, and, and get realigned with the truth. The truth is good times are coming for us and the entire world and for everyone who cares to join us. And there's going to be peace and there's going to be prosperity. And it's going to be good for everyone who accepts it and wants it. And the only thing is, the only edge that we have is you heard it here first so let's not 
let's not find out about it like everybody else. When it happens, let's all say like, yeah, we knew, we knew. That's, that's what always happens to us. Miracles always happen to us. We're the Jews, of course, of course, okay? So keep it positive, bring positivity, joy, radiance, light, hope to the entire world.